Days ago, the Pentagon released scary videotape with the audio tacked onto it showing Iran speedboats apparently harassing three U.S. Navy warships, including a guided missile destroyer in the Strait of Hormuz. That's the same place 20 years ago that a U.S. guided missile near the end of the Iran-Iraq war brought down an Iran civilian airliner killing nearly 300 people, including 66 children. On the tape that was just released by the Pentagon last week, a menacing voice is heard to say in broken English, I am coming to you. You will explode after a few minutes. The only problem now the Navy is saying they don't know if that voice had anything to do with the speedboats. They don't know if that voice was Iranian. It sounded to me like Borat had broken in. <laughs> it sounded, in fact, completely staged. The tape with the inflammatory audio threats was prominently aired on every single national TV, radio, uh, TV and radio network in the country, including PBS and NPR. Few of these networks have given prominence to the doubts about the audio. We should be contacting Congress this week, senators, Congress members, and demanding that they have a congressional hearing on whether this was some sort of hoax to provoke us into a war, just like the Gulf of Tonkin hoax provoked us into the last war. The tape was used by President Bush to threaten Iran yet again with the words, no option is off the table. He called it a provocation. It was nicely timed, this tape, very nicely timed for his trip to the Middle East where he wants to unite the Sunni and Arab regimes against the uh, Shia and the, per uh, the Persians of Iran. Cheney, as you know, was in the Gulf a while back threatening Iran. American citizens have to ask themselves, who's threatening whom? Who's provoking whom? I try my best to imagine, as you know, I'm a student of talk radio and American media, try to uh, imagine how talk radio in this country would react if somehow the situation were reversed, if somehow there were huge Iranian naval warships off the Atlantic Ocean. And I, I can almost hear that talk radio screamer, Glenn Beck, on CNN and on his many uh, clear channel radio stations exhorting the Yacht Club members from the elite U.S. Republican Guard to go out and harass the Iranian warships with their yachts. <laughs> um, the scenario, I guess, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because while well-off Republicans are very good at starting wars lately, they certainly don't like to fight in them. I think of Mitt Romney endorsing as loudly as he can the occupation of Iraq, 120 percent, endorsing the threats to Iran, and I think about his five military-aged sons bravely fighting off the terrorists from Iowa to New Hampshire to Michigan to South Carolina. My focus, of course, is media. When it comes to mainstream media, there is one imperative, one rule that best explains U.S. coverage of war and military of intervention. With apologies to the WHO, that rule is we will get fooled again. Sometimes corporate media will debate military tactics or the pace of military success. But rarely do they question the legality, the morality, the divine right of U.S. military or CIA to invade in country after country across the globe. From the perspective of independent, accurate journalism, mainstream media coverage of the run-up to the invasion of Iraq was a massive failure. Unfortunately, we know from a historical perspective uh, if we've seen the new War Made Easy movie featuring Norman Solomon, you know that mainstream media have repeatedly throughout history led our country into war or invasion, repeatedly based on concocted evidence, false pretense, repeatedly relying on official sources who were unreliable and usually unnamed. One of the prime culprits globally in the journalistic failure called Iraq 
was a former employer of mine, the media mogul Rupert Murdoch. His media outlets were the loudest in continent after continent after continent, from Australia to England to here with Fox News Channel and the New York Post and the Weekly Standard in pushing the loudest for war with Iraq. And now he owns the Wall Street Journal. And if the FCC gets his way, he'll be buying up more and more media properties when they abolish the cross ownership or weaken the cross ownership rule. But the journalistic failure of Iraq goes way beyond Rupert Murdoch. It goes beyond the TV networks. It goes beyond talk radio. And it goes right to the, the two leading so-called liberal dailies in our country. In the months leading up to the Iraq invasion, the Washington Post published nearly 30 editorials in favor of the war. On its op-ed page, also dominated by hawks denouncing war skeptics as liars and fools and worse, after semi-apologizing for its coverage leading up to the invasion of Iraq, how did the Washington Post rectify the situation? They hired George Bush's chief speechwriter, Michael Gerzen, as a regular columnist. He's the man who spun the false rhetoric that was swallowed by the Washington Post editorialist. He's the man who inserted the references to the yellow cake from Niger fable in President Bush's speeches. He's the man who concocted that uh, soundbite warning about Iraqi nukes that we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. He's the guy who helped prepare Colin Powell's dishonest speech to the United Nations. What's the motto at the Washington Post? We will get fooled again. The New York Times front page was instrumental for, in invading Iraq with scare stories relying on unnamed White House or intelligence sources that turned out to be totally false about Iraq's alleged nuclear weapons threat. That was not just a failure of the reporters Judith Miller and Michael Gordon. That was a failure of the paper's top news editors, most of whom are still in power. After semi-apologizing for its bad coverage, how did the New York Times rectify its situation? By giving even more power to the reporter Michael Gordon. He writes the page one articles in allegedly objective voice on the need to keep troop strength up in Iraq. And then he appears on TV where he becomes an unabashed advocate for the Iraq occupation. Last February, it was Michael Gordon who wrote an important page one story with the amazing claim that Iran's supreme leader had approved sending lethal explosives into Iraq to attack U.S. soldiers. It was a claim that even Bush was retreating from within a matter of days. But one couldn't assess Gordon's charges because, as usual, they were virtually entirely based on anonymous sources. About 25 times in the article, Gordon wrote, United States intelligence asserts, administration officials said, some American intelligence experts believe, American officials say, on and on and on. After analyzing this article, the blogger Jonathan Schwartz came up with a theory. He said, quote, Gordon is not an actual person, but rather a voice-activated tape recorder, end quote. <laughs> Whether Iraq in 03 or Iran in 07 and 08, the New York Times motto seems to be, we will get fooled again. Last week, the New York Times had a fascinating article headlined, for Pentagon and news media, relations improve with a shift in war coverage. When you read the lead sentence, it's a bit like that children's game, count the errors in this picture. The lead sentence reads, the anguished relationship between the military and the news media appears to be on the mend as battlefield successes from the troop increase in Iraq are reflected in more upbeat news coverage. I mean, after reading this article, I began to think that we could come up with a solution at the New York Times if we just instituted random drug testing for hallucinatory drugs. 